Well, good evening and welcome to our College Sports Communicators Live webinar presented by the CSCU Committee. We're pleased to offer this session on getting creative, what's new in graphic design, video production, and social media content for young sports communicators and creatives. Thank you for joining this important session. And today we'll discuss the ways that athletic communication staffs can look at where the creative media realm has been, what the trends are now, and what might be coming on the horizon in order to highlight your school, department, and teams effectively. We will gear our conversation to young athletic communications professionals, students, graduate assistants, and interns to help you navigate through these work situations. Our presenters are CSC members and leaders in the college athletic creative realm, and they're here to offer their thoughts and expertise and take your questions. And we welcome your questions at any time. Just make sure to place them in the Q&A function on this Zoom. You can use the chat function to comment, but please use the Q&A channel for your questions and we'll get to them as we go through the presentation. I'm Olivia Dieterlin, the newest member of the College Sports Communications National Staff. I'm the Assistant Director for Communications and Creative Content, which is a new position that was made this year actually, or last year, to help focus on developing creative content and digital strategies. Today, I will be serving as the webinar moderator. As a reminder, we are recording this webinar and later on, the CSU, it'll be available on the CSU website and YouTube page to watch it on demand. And we're also gonna offer it on numerous podcast channels. So please invite your fellow current, C, fellow current CSC colleagues to listen and watch this too. So we've got lots to cover, we'll get started. Um, we appreciate you all joining us today and we're gonna go through some quick introductions of our panelists. And I'm gonna start with you, Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Mixey. Uh, I'm Athletic Communications Assistant at Siena College in Loudonville, New York, just north of Albany. I'm in my uh, seventh year in Athletic Communications and my sixth year at Siena. Perfect. Let's head over to Amanda now. Just a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Amanda Phillips. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Associate Director of Athletics Communications and Digital Media Strategist at Oberlin College. Um, in Ohio, just outside of Cleveland, this is my fifth year in athletics communications and third year at Oberlin. Awesome. And now Jasmine, our last panelist for today. Hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine Washington. I'm currently the Director of Creative Services and Marketing at the University of New Orleans. Um, I've been here since 2022, but I've been in the community, sports communications and creative world since um, 2019 when I was still in school. Well, thank you guys for sitting down with us today. Um, I wanted to start with Amanda. Um, something we talked about in the planning session was since you're someone who works in D3, just kind of you might have more to give to this starting off is how do you make program styles and trends work for you in your situation at your school? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... A lot of it starts with understanding our student body and understanding our market. So as a small D3 college in the middle of Ohio, um, our market is not as big as in Ohio State, which is just a few hours down the road. So understanding what our students are looking for in an AFCOM's office, in game day programs, in you know their game day and fan experience, um, understanding that is kind of the foundation of how we've built our brand how we build our social media presence. Um, so starting with them and knowing that everything is going to be very, um, it's going to be a more intimate experience than your major Power 5 D1 experience. Uh, that's kind of where we we build everything off of that. Joe, um, how, how do you guys use different programs where you're at? Yeah, so as a as a Division One school, uh, but a smaller mid major, I mean, I like to have an open communication with uh, others around me um, for creative ideas. Um, I'm young, but there are others that are younger. There are others that have been around, and and sometimes even the coaches know uh, what they want. And obviously, um, you want to find a way to take all the voices in the room and make that into something uh, that's kind of well received around the board. Um, but I like to I like to take input um, from others and uh, be able to make a product, especially on social media, uh, that communicates the information it needs to communicate. It's not overly communicative, uh, but it's it's not lacking anything. And then also it's it's well received uh, by the coaches and of course the student athletes as well. 
um, because they're the ones that are sharing it on social media. They're the ones that are, um, you know, bringing our platform to the forefront with their followings and even some student athletes that have uh, gained larger followings on their own. So I think it's good to receive input and, and try not to be the smartest person in the room when you're making creative and when you're uh, determining what creative is going to look like on a long-term basis. And Jasmine, um, how would you say for where you're at at UNO in terms of like, maybe not even just tools you're using, but in terms of kind of your team? Like the team and our dynamic and mm -hmm. how it's and things. Yeah. So um, it's me doing the creative and the social and the graphics and the photography. And I oversee our marketing GA. And then we have uh, three communications professionals um, or SIDs. And what we do, what I do with them is talking specifically to the programs is they have access to Adobe and Photoshop and stuff, but like my marketing GA, she's not as experienced in Photoshop. So what I do with her uh, to try to make it all still flow where I don't have to do all the graphics is I'll send her like our brand assets, um, the PNGs and making sure they're transparent and stuff so she can use it in Canva, which we did talk about Canva in our planning, pre-planning session as well. Um, just so it's easy for her to use while still making sure that our brand is consistent across communications, creative and marketing at the same time. Um, so I think that answers your question, but if you want to follow up, then you can too. Yeah, definitely. We, we especially talked about in the planning meeting, how you're going to have a wide variety of people who are making content. Like sometimes it might be a coach that's making something. It, it might be a GA. So kind of this might apply to all of you, but um, we can have Amanda go first. Um, how do you keep on brand? Jasmine kind of touched on that a little bit when so many different people are making content. Yeah, um, we start every year with kind of an updated brand guideline, brand standards. Um, just this year, we kind of refreshed our whole brand, um, which was really fun. And it's super exciting to kind of find where the brand is in current times. Um, but we present to all the coaches uh, the current, um, like our asset library, we present all of the logos that are allowed to be used. We represent what our primary logo is, uh, different examples in, in how logos should be used. So we have a few that are protected that we don't let the coaches use and only the department is allowed to use. So we make sure to have a really open line of communication with our coaches, with students who are creating content, with ourselves, um, and then also within the campus community, um, bookstores with main communications. Uh, we try to just keep that line of communication very open so that everybody knows who is in charge of the brand and also what they can use within the brand. Um, I think that's really the most important part. And for the most part, everything else kind of falls into place. We use ScoreShots, which is an awesome software that makes designing graphics super easy. And it also allows us to determine our primary set of colors, our primary fonts, um, also input all of the logos that are available. We can also remove any logos at any point in time if we decide to retire one or another. Yeah, Joe, is there anything specifically that you're using at Siena to maybe, maybe you might be using something different than other people are even at the same institution. Um, and what, what do you find useful? So we actually also went through a, a bit of a major brand refresh um, with our new dog logo here uh, back in August. And I wouldn't say it was fun, but getting everybody on the same page was definitely really important um, because it was something that was actually brought upon by our, marketing and communications department with the college. And then we had to, it was important to communicate that to the coaches and everybody creating. So, um, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, we've had a lot of coaches and um, other interns and just students that have worked with us that have really taken Canva is a big one um, where we find others using Canva and um, they, they're allowed to have a little bit of creative freedom with it um, because it takes a lot off of our plate and it, it allows us to have a working relationship with them. What's nice about a program like that is, uh, like Amanda was saying, kind of like score shots, is there's a lot of importing that's done. Um, there's a lot of continuity that you can have. And um, I think like something like, you know, sharing 
uh, logos, uh, approved logos in a zip file, sharing them in a Google Drive, and just having that open line of communication is extremely important um, because I, I think that at the end of the day, um, some coaches, depending on how big your department is, depending on no matter what level, you know, they understand that you might not be able to get to something as small as a, a birthday graphic or something like that. And sometimes they want to help and they're willing to take the necessary steps to learn. So empowering them and meeting them and take some take, you know, 20, 30 minutes and sit down with them and, and try to help them get to that point. Uh, that can be extremely mutually beneficial. So being able to share across different platforms, whether using something like a score shots or a box out or whether, you know, I primarily use Photoshop, but others use Canva. And then kind of, I would say this too, taking the time, like I told somebody on Canva today, oh, can you add a drop shadow? And they're like, what's that? It's called, and they use some word I've never heard of. And I'm like, yeah, that, but um, Canva, it's kind of a little bit of a translative thing, but taking the time to understand basically uh, the other programs like Canva, just so you could be on the same page. Yeah, especially in my last position where I was working for a conference, we use Canva a lot, especially because we had graduate assistants and fellows who had done no graphic design before and they needed to learn that stuff. And it's really nice because they have templates and you're able to build like a brand kit in there. So they know all of the colors and the logo. So I found that super helpful, um, especially with people that maybe don't have as much experience with Adobe, which it takes a little bit of learning. Um, what are some things that you guys have found in terms of simple simple things that may be easier things to help make a big difference to enhance your content? Well, I can speak on that. Um, specifically this year, I just realized how important photography is when it comes to like making graphics and stuff. Um, because before this year, I would take the pictures of our student athletes, cut the, cut out the stage shots, and then I wouldn't edit them at all. Like, I would just leave them how they were taken from the camera. So speaking to like what the small things that you can do to make your graphics look better um, is one, actually taking the time to edit your the photos that you're using. And then I also realized too, using textures and drop shadows also makes a very big difference in making graphics. Like from last year to this year, my graphics have improved so much just by making those small little tweaks and those small little changes and things um and then yeah that's it really <laughs> um we do have a question here in the q a function um it says as someone who manages the all of the graphics and social media for division three school do you feel it's important to create a design guide that shows the themes, assets, and other pieces of design to share with coaches and other admins? And I'll have you take this first, um, Amanda. Yeah, um, I think it's a really good question. We have gone back and forth with whether we want to make a design guide at Oberlin. I think it depends on the kind of staff that you're working with. If it's you alone determining this design guide, and then who is asking and wanting to use it, right? So like, at Oberlin, we could create a design guide and we feel confident that our coaches and admin would use it. But if you're working with a huge number of coaches or you have a lot of students that are creating content, sometimes it's harder to rein in who is doing what. And um, it kind of can take away from some of the creativity that some of these students and, and um, like coaches and admin have. So if you're going to design or create a design guide, I think you need to put in some really clear examples and also understand that there's going to be a lot of questions and a lot of need for flexibility in the time that your coaches and your admin are taking on this design guide. In my experience, I'm working with even just implementing brand, like a, like a set color palette that has taken well over a semester to really get something consistent, um, like where everybody is using the same hex code. So if you're going to implement a design guide, I think it's important that you also are comfortable with it changing and evolving as the semester, as the year, as the season um, goes on. Yeah, definitely. Um, Joe, did you have something for building a design guide? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, whether it's something where you have, if you had a company sometimes that you worked with 
originally for the logos and elements that you have. Sometimes they'll make one for you. Or if you have a licensing company that you work with, or even a um, even if you're working with somebody like uh, Under Armour or Nike or an Adidas, they might help you with that. Um, or you can make your own. You could make your own, put them together in a PDF and say, use this, you know, don't use this and put an X through it. Um, but it, it's important, I think, because it gives everybody the guidelines specifically, not necessarily for like, um, you can't put this line here on Photoshop, but for, for logo usage, like Amanda was saying at the beginning, like logo usage, like we don't want you to use this logo for this but you can use it for this. The other thing, and this is something that we ran into is all of a sudden when we dropped our new logos, I had 25 emails from coaches asking me about, can I put this design on my uniforms? Can I do this this way? Can I use, you know, logo number 63 or something? And if you have a design guide, you can say here, look at the design guide. This lays out what you can do with this and your usage for this. And then also it has your codes on it as well. So you can go into your RGB. You can make sure everybody's lined up and, um, and, and then you can take that a step further and show people how they can do that as well. Because I, I think one of the things that um, kind of goes by the wayside sometimes, something that we, we're focused on graphics, we're focused on external stuff, but th internal things like coaches designing uniforms, and then you show up all of a sudden and, you know, there's like a, like a, you know, paw with the fill taken out. You're like, what in the world is this? And it's like, yeah, you know, I got this approved. So um, you could kind of nip that in the butt a little bit beforehand, um, just inter more internal things. So um, I think absolutely design guide, whether it's some big production or whether it's just something that lays out the ground rules. Yeah, and if I can add to on that, um, like I think Joe, yeah, good point. Like design guide versus brand guide too. Like we absolutely have a brand guide that outlines are which logos can be used and how they should be used versus I guess when I was reading design guide I see it as like how we create our graphics not so much the structure as much as kind of like the overlay on top of it so if you design or create a design guide very important that you specify within it like if these are going to be logos and how they are used if that's black and white you can't change anything about that or if everything needs to be approved as far as like what's going on uniforms, on bags, on gear, on cleats, on shoes, et cetera. Um, very important that all that is laid out and very clear because with design, as with anything creative, super open to interpretation. Yeah, thank you. Um, a couple questions in the chat about um, graphic design. I'm going to touch upon this Canva one that we have first. It says, you're talking about Canva, which I understand is an online graphic design tool. Is this a free tool? Um, we have some students who are really not graphic design savvy and might be intimidated by trying to learn Photoshop. And um, there's the free option of this tool um, that I have used before. I think the paid option is more of like, if you did want to use like the brand, the branding standards that you could put in and some of the more kind of stock options in there, they'll have like different things that they're free or if it's something that's a little more detailed, it might be more of a kind of paid pro plan. Um, does anyone have, has anyone else used Canva a lot that would have an idea on that one? Yeah, I've used it a lot and it's basically, um, it's a, it's a more, the user face for it is for people who are just now starting to learn graphic design, basically. Like when you open Photoshop, there's a lot of different buttons. It doesn't tell you exactly what they do. Like you really have to YouTube it or Google it to figure it out. But, um, but with Canva, part of it is free. And then like um, she had mentioned, it's the other part of it. You do have to pay for specific things. It's kind of just like an upgraded version it used to all be free, which I hate that now that there's a Canva Pro, um, but like you can't cut out, um, like you can't remove backgrounds on Canva if you don't have the paid version, which when you're working in sports is a lot of kind of what you're doing, but there is still the possibility to play around with it. And obviously you can drop in if you have stage shots or action shots, there's ways that you could, there's like frames in there that are free that you could still make the graphic look really nice. So um, there's levels to it. Yeah, and I, I know that Adobe has something similar. It's called Adobe Express. I haven't played around with it a lot, 
but I know that it's similar in the terms of it's kind of shooting to be something along the lines of Canva. Um, another question here from Jake. Um, I'm in my first year as an SID intern after graduating. I'm pretty good at working with existing templates to change or spice them up. How do I take that next step? I'd love to be able to make my own graphics. I would love to answer this question because this is literally how I started my career. Um, so right now, I well, not right now. In 2019, I was in an uh, SID intern with the University of Maryland. I was the contact for a track and field and cross country. So obviously, as, at the time, as a student intern, um, they had templates that they sent to me and was like, hey, like, can you mess around with this, this, that, and the third? And then what I would do is with those templates, I took them and I made them look different. So I basically played around with the different layers in Photoshop um, and I moved the text around. I would cut out my own um, players, my own student athletes and just change it up because the templates that they gave me were for like basketball or football and it's a lot different than track. So I just played around with it in that aspect. And then the first time that I actually got to make my own graphics was when I was at the so Southern Conference. Um, and it was a whole different world because you literally have to start from scratch. So my advice with you is, or my advice to you is to continue practicing with the existing templates that you have. Um, make sure you're still staying on brand for wherever you're working at right now. Like don't change the fonts, don't change the colors. If they have certain brand assets, still use them, but just like move them around. Use YouTube. YouTube was my best friend in learning how to become a def uh, graphic designer. And it comes, it all comes with time. Um, in terms of how you take that next step, challenge yourself. Like over the summer, if you're still interning with this institution, um, create a template, uh, create a few graphics and then see, like, don't be afraid to ask like, hey, can we use this? Or, hey, what are your thoughts on this? The one thing that I always took away when I was interning, um, my first boss, Rose DePaula, she's still at uh, the University of Maryland, women's basketball contact, was this, your internship is always going to be what you make of it. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to make something. Take it to them and be like, hey, do you like this? Or could we use things for this? And then who knows, that might be the next template that you guys use for your institution. So that's what I would say to you, Jake. Um, and if you have any other questions, like, like I said, this is exactly how my career path was. So you can reach out to me personally as well if you want to. Yeah, Amanda, Joe, do you guys have anything else to add to just kind of taking that next step to get over the Adobe learning curve? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to add to that. I had a similar, Jasmine, I had a similar experience to that of just like being thrown into the fire with learning graphics. And it's like, here's Adobe, just like kind of figure it out type um type experience, but um, YouTube is phenomenal. There are so many great resources, YouTube University. I'm a graduate of it. Um, and, you know, the one thing, the way that I learned how to use Adobe, and I'm not a pro or anything amazing at Adobe, but understanding it, I would find graphics that I liked that would appear on Skull Sparks, that would appear on my favorite team accounts, that would appear all over um, social media. And I'd find them and I'd just try to replicate what I saw, um, whether using their colors, using my school colors, using whatever color palette fonts I wanted to use. Um, replicating that really helped me understand kind of the layering process and how to add subtle details to a graphic and add like the shadowing effects, the drop shadows, and add like the strokes around wording and typeface. So, um, that's another, you know, idea, you know, as you get into the summer and you have a little more free time, um, finding graphics that you like, just kind of replicating them. And and then you can go step for it further and like add your own twist to it. And then you're getting your own kind of designs out of that. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that's a lot of how, um, at least I was able to figure out Adobe. Yeah. And then I just want to also add off of that as well. I do this thing when I'm on Twitter now, like I follow a whole bunch of sports creatives. So whenever I, and Skull Sparks. So whenever I see people's graphics, I literally am looking at that one post for maybe like three to five minutes, trying to mentally break down what the layers are and what they might've done to get that graphic done. And then, so like, sometimes I'm a visual person and sometimes I'm a visual person, actually, I was, I'll change my, my answer. I'm a visual person. So seeing that in the back of my mind, when I'm going to create my graphics for UNO, 
I'm like, oh, hey, I remember I saw X, Y, and Z do this. I'm going to try to figure out how they did it. So that's a lot of like going back to my very first point in the beginning, talking about like making for photo- making sure that, like editing the photos that you're using makes a really big difference or the textures or just like different assets that they use in the background. Just challenge yourself. And like she said, try to replicate what they're doing without copying it. Take it and make it yours because that's what we do in this industry. Awesome. We have another question here in the chat that's kind of specifically towards, we talked about it a little bit, but like cutting out athletes um, for graphics, what are you guys using? I know something that I've used is um, Adobe has a new function with kind of the AI stuff that it it's able to remove the background for you. And it's not always perfect, but it's actually like really improving and doing a really good job. And I also use that function too in Canva as well. Um, I can start. Um, so I take the easy way out. So <laughs> I know some people use the pen tool. I hate the pen tool. I think it takes too much time. I know some people use the magnet, the magnetic lasso. I use that, but I don't use that first. So what I do is I literally do the select tool and I do select subject and then I mask it. Before I would inverse it and then delete the background. And then I realized I rasterized my layer. So if I try to make it bigger or smaller, it would get really pixelized and it would look really, really bad. So select subject, mask, and then I go in with the erase tool. If it's like, it didn't select the subject the way that it needed to, I go in with the eraser tool. And depending on if you want to erase or make the background come back into the cutout, you have to change the color from black or white. Um, so you just have to like play around with the erase tool and the black and white is in the bottom left of Photoshop. Um, and then I just like clean up the edges that way. If that doesn't work and if there's like a small space that I'm trying to erase or trying to clean up the cutout, um, I'll use, that's when I'll use the, mag- the magnetic lasso because it's a little bit easier to get around like the jagged edges and stuff rather than having to change the size of your eraser to get into those little creases and crevices and stuff. Um, if you're not familiar with Photoshop, that might've been a little bit confusing. Um, but so if you aren't familiar with Photoshop, basically select subject and then mask, and then you can use an eraser to clean up. Yeah, I really like the, um, select subject inverse that that's a fairly new, um, thing I can't say that I um have learned how to mask correctly yet I kind of <laughs> go around it a little bit but yeah the um uh, always update your Adobe software because you'll wake up one day and all of a sudden there'll be a background deleter and you'll be like wow like where was this been so and generative fill too I don't know if anybody's used that that's a little bit of a different animal but like you know if I uh if a guy's missing a hand you can put his fingers back on or something of that nature it's pretty cool what you can do, but um, yeah, if, if, especially with, I found that the um, masking is the way to go. If, if you have time to do it, or if you're um, the, um, the select and then the, uh, the inverse and delete uh, the background works. If you have a contrasting uh, subject on a background, like a green on white or something like that. Um, and then I, I like the magnetic lasso tool for, for getting stuff i've used i learned how to use that a long time ago and even the the lasso tool or even the erase tool if you're freehanding like big areas of um layer i guess one thing and i don't know if anybody will think this is the correct way or not one thing that i do sometimes like say you have a girl with curly hair and you're trying to get the white background out of her hair use the clone stamp tool and you can clone the hair and and not i wouldn't use it on very big amounts of picture but um sometimes you can do little nuances like that that when you zoom out and you put that on a graphic um it it won't be as noticeable but it'll be better than if you just left a blotch of white there on a bunch of black hair or something like that but um getting back to kind of what um like if you see something on a graphic and you want to know how it's done like if you see something that the university of new orleans put put out and then you go on their athletic staff directory and you see they have a director of creative and it's jasmine shoot her an email hey i'm hey i'm joe uh hey jasmine how'd you do that how'd you how'd you put that pirate inside that box there that's crazy like and then she'll probably just tell you 
how she did it. And then you'd be like, wow. And that'll save you from maybe having to YouTube it for 15 minutes or something. So I, I think there's a lot of people that are willing to help if you're scrolling around social media. Yeah. Touching upon like seeing something that you really like, we have a question that's kind of along those lines. What are some trends, tricks, or graphic elements that you guys have noticed that have stood out to you in recent graphics? And it kind of ties into what we wanted to talk about was where you draw your creativity from. Yeah, I can start with this question. Um, I try to stay online and look at what's like, it's hard to say, like, what is ever trending, right? Creativity and, and design is always so um, personal. And it's an, a whole opinion based, you know, like whether I think something is cool, doesn't mean that the rest of the, you know, market thinks it's really cool. But um, some things I've noticed recently are having nice, like, grain a grain texture grainy texture over um different backgrounds just over like graphics in general using um blur in different spaces of graphics especially in backgrounds um another thing is uh using cursive lettering as an accent um when i think of cursive i kind of think of like baseball script like um what was the Oakland Athletics? They have a nice cursive script. Um, Padres too, kind of those cursive scripts. I think those look really nice, especially when you're creating graphics for softball, baseball, and also spring sports in general. Um, other design elements, you guys can probably touch on some other things I'm sure I've missed, but I would say kind of that gray texture and using photos in general has been a huge trend that I have seen skyrocket um, in the last at definitely two years. Photos in general, just using photos in every graphic is just very, very trendy right now. Yeah, and I, the photo thing, I was, that was going to be my answer. I've said this probably three times already, but um, just the way that people are editing their photos, like, and right now I'm not specifically talking about just like increasing the brightness or the color saturation or anything like that. Like, it's really cool things. I saw something, I think it was University of Southern California the other day. I don't know if they have lacrosse or not. It was a school that was yellow, red, mainly yellow and red. And they had like a yellow background and the way that they duplicated their subject, their cutout and put a different blend mode on each different layer made the picture look like phenomenal um so like that I would say that's a trend and another trend that I realized over the summer was the use of negative space and empty space um in graphics and not making it like this the cutout might be this small and then like if the rest of my background is the background this is the subject and everything else around me would be white. So that's another trend that I've seen. Um, and then just like the drop shadows and how to really make drop shadows look like drop shadows, like real life drop shadows too. Um, those are like the three things that I would say that I've seen that I've been trending lately. Yeah, Joe, do you have any? Yeah, I was actually going to piggyback off you with the with the photos. I we. I've been using a lot of camera raw filter lately and um, you can get a little bit and it's pretty easy if you, if you know how to use it um, and just putting some texture on your subject or bringing out some of the defining um, of like the skin tone and, and just playing around with it a little bit. Um, I think that goes a long way, um, even for like lower level graphics where you don't necessarily have a full time creative to play around with that the whole time. Um, I think the use of uh, certain uses of gradients, the obvious, if you've been tracking with us on Photoshop, the gradient tools taken a huge dive in the last couple of years, um, but you can still kind of make gradients and then throw them in your, um, like on the corners of your graphic or something that kind of brings out the colors. Um, I think that's cool. And then um, sometimes just color adjustments on your photos. It's amazing how you can, like when you're using a lot of photos, these guys talked about using a lot of photos. You can take them and make them um, almost like an illusion or a facade, make it look like something it's not by layering and by putting them in different places um, could definitely, definitely help. We're just using them as a background or something without it getting overcrowded. 
Yeah, and then just one last thing on photos, because he talked about, like, um, I don't know if it was Joe or Amanda, but you guys mentioned, like, adding the grain or the noise. That's something that I do with our graphics now is on my cutouts or basically on the whole graphic, I'll add either the grain or the noise. And then something else with, like, our colors, our privateer blue, that's what we call it. It's our lighter blue. Um, whenever they're wearing uniforms that have that blue in it, I always saturate it to make it pop a little bit more. So like if you work for an institution that has, for instance, so Joe with the the yellow or the gold that you have in your school, saturating that a little bit more to kind of, I hate saying this, but making the graphics pop. Um, I don't think it's more so, it makes your graphics pop, but it also helps enhance your brand in a, in a way because if that color is over, not oversaturated, but saturated enough, when people are, all scroll, are scrolling on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, it's something that's going to be eye catching and make them want to stop and see your graphics. So that's just something else that I would say. Um, I think someone had asked a question earlier about like how to make your graphics look, look better, look better, or like the cutouts um, in that aspect as well. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for the graphic information. Um, something I know that we also wanted to touch upon was when we're coming up with content, how do we keep in mind the student experience, the student athlete experience to kind of enhance them and stay with making sure that we're telling their stories. And I think, Joe, this was something that you really wanted to talk about. Yeah, I think um, as far as the student athlete experience goes, I, I think especially um, if, if you're at a smaller school, um, if, if you went to your coaches and you said, hey, coach, you know, I want you to give me five examples of graphics you like. Nine times out of 10, they're going to be power fives. And um, that's okay. You know, those are really good examples. And um, sometimes you might think the first thing you might think is, oh, I don't have the resources. But I think there's different ways to accomplish different things. And when it comes to the um, the student athlete experience, I think putting trying to seek out those trends, trying to seek out, even if you do it a different way than other people do it, um, like photography and this is something like when you take your photos for a photo day um those are the times where you can have you know your athletes hone in their creativity um and in some cases talk to the athletes and and see maybe what they're looking for because they're they're the ones that are scrolling through social media they're the ones um that ultimately are gonna spread uh these graphics so i think um different little elements like um when you're doing a, like, for example, so I had, um, I had a, I have a coach that really, really took on in his spare time doing graphic design. I spent a few hours, I sat down with him and he helped me design templates. And that was great for me because sometimes it's, it's learning from square one takes a long time sometimes to be able to accomplish what you want to. If you can have somebody, even from your, one of your coaching staffs that can add insight and help you, um, you're able to make some really trendy graphics and, and display the student athletes. Um, cause that's what definitely we want to be doing and we don't want to be able to, we don't want to have to take all of our time up, uh, to do it. So I think working with the, the resources around you and, and maybe some soliciting some, uh, feedback every once in a while would be good, um, to try to, you know, tell the story of your student athletes ultimately. Yeah, I'd also like to add that like investing, I know we keep going back around like photos, 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 but that really is the biggest, like when I was an athlete, I always wanted to have photos of, of course, myself playing, but also like my teammates playing and like my team as a whole. And then my friends and other teams playing, like investing in photography, I think is your best as, as a creative, your best possible tool, like the best investment that you can make as a creative. Um, and it isn't always about having the best camera and the best lens. There are a lot of really great kit lenses and kit cameras out there. Um, but investing in like understanding composition of photography and understanding how each sport operates. Like when I'm taking photos of swimming, breaststroke and butterfly stroke, I am at a completely different angle than I am at like freestyle, freestyle and backstroke. And then I changed the whole game when it comes to diving one meter versus three meter, right? Investing that time, um, even if it's just to speak to your athletes or the coaches like, hey, can you find some photos on the internet 
um, kind of like what Joe, you were saying, like sitting down with a coach and being like, hey, can you send some graphics that you really like? Can you send some photos of your sport that you really like? Understanding those different angles. Um, Because I know for Oberlin, at least, our most successful posts and our most interacted um, posts and graphics are ones where we focus a photo first, or it's just posting a photo, right? A picture tells a thousand words is the old adage, but I think it, that that carries a lot of weight in, in the creative world. Yeah, you talked about a specific sport in swimming. That made me think of something. Um, swimming is one of those like uh, I'm going to talk to all any any track SIDs or anybody creating with track and field here cross country. Um, the athletes are moving all the time. You're not really going to find a swimmer going, you know, so like they're going to be breathing. They're going to be struggling in track. I had conversations with my coaches over the year about the um, the trail step. I think it is when the foot's on the ground, that's bad. And when they're up in the air, that's good. The photo will be better. So have those conversations. Your coaches will tell you, you know, sports, uh, where, where they, you know, lacrosse, women's lacrosse is another one because the goggles and the hair and this and that and have a conversation with your coach because uh, and, and the athletes, you know, um, those are things that we don't think about sometimes when we're posting the photos. we got a million things to do. We want to put the photos up. Um, but that, that couple conversations and open line of communication about little stuff like that, uh, it's a, a good point to bring up. Yeah, I want to add to that real quick. I accidentally, earlier this year, I accidentally posted a picture of the other team blocking one of our players' shots. And I realized it like 30 minutes after the game, like after I had posted it, and I was like, oh, snap, I have to delete that. So, yeah, just not only just having a conversation with your coaches, but also being mindful of the type of photos that you're posting. Um, because obviously that's not a good look for us on our Instagram when I'm posting a caption about us just winning. And then I go back and look at the picture. I'm like, hold on. The other team was just blocking his shot and it obviously didn't go in. So yeah, having those conversations, but just being mindful too. And I will add one thing about that is to, if you are a creative that has like a staff of student photographers, we have a staff of student photographers and videographers who are amazing and talented and wonderful, but they don't know every single sport the way that we might know every single sport, relaying the information that you get from your coaches, like the, um, the running step or the, the trail step that you said, Joe, or like Jasmine, like the block shot, like what may be intuitive to a coach or to us is not necessarily intuitive to somebody who is just trying to learn the sport, just trying to learn the the trade of the field. Um, so I know we created like a uh, kind of a, a three-step guide to taking photos, like the three things you have to have. You have to have the face in the photo. You want to have the body or the action in the photo. And then you want to have... Um, Oh, I'm blanking. Oh, the eyes and the photo. Um, if you have at least two of those three things, you're going to have a successful photo almost every single time. And I think that's been the easiest way for our students to consistently take good photos. And you can go from a gallery of 2000 photos where 200 of them are good and usable and postable, where we're able to go to then like a gallery of 800 where consistently 600 of them are usable and postable. Um, so remembering that your students are very talented and are very knowledgeable and want to do their best, making sure that the tools that you have, you also share those with them so that they can succeed just as much as you're wanting them to succeed. I think that's um, it's very crucial, very important. Yeah. And one more on the topic of like creating content, we talked a lot about graphics, talked a lot about photos. We have a question here. Um, that's more about videos and reels and in that space, especially when it comes to um, some of the sports that maybe are lower visibility that don't really compete at home. What's some of the advice that you guys have for like shooting style or trends that can help with this to kind of make sure we're getting video reel content and what ideas, since it is a sphere that has so many things, what, what kind of stuff do you guys recommend or what are you finding that works? Yeah, so we had our track and field photo day in the beginning of January, and I think something that'll really help with that because our track team never competes at home because we don't have an at-home indoor track or outdoor track. Um, so they normally go to LSU to compete at most things, but what we do at our 
photo day is we call it a content day. So we get their stage shots. We get a number, a good number of them. Each athlete has at least 30 of them. Um, we have that. And then we do TikToks with them. And then we also, this year, something new was I went into After Effects and I created like an animation background that we use for basketball. We literally use it for every single sport since I came back. Um, so we got video of that. So, so that when they are on the road and these types of sports aren't really broadcast either we can fall back on the photos that we have we can fall back on the tiktoks that we have i had conversations with one of the student athletes who seemed like she was very interested in social media she sends me tiktoks that she makes with her teammates all the time like i have three of them that i still have to post sometime obviously between indoor and outdoor just posted one yesterday so like one i would say build a uh, I don't know what the word is, an inventory, build an inventory of content that you can fall back on one, two, talk to the student athletes, figure out who might be interested in social media. With TikTok nowadays, they're making TikToks all the time, especially since they're student athletes as well. They're trying to get their own brand out there. So don't be afraid to ask them, hey, if you have TikToks, send them to me. Like I'll post them on the account. Um, something else that we literally just started today is a series called Walking with New Orleans. Um, and shameless plug, our Instagram is UNO Privateers. And basically what we did with it was my marketing GA, they went out on the track. There's not our track, it's like a community track. Um, they went on the track and we just recorded them like asking questions about the season. We did rapid fire questions with her. Um, so, and then we turned that into a reel. So, that content is something that we recorded the day of photo day. So it was a few weeks ago and it goes to speaking on like building the inventory um, and just trying to keep up with the trends yourself. But also, like I said, I think the most important part here is talking with the student athletes and if they're interested in social media, which they probably are, that can really help you because they're also more comfortable around each other then they might be with you. Um, so I hope that helped. Um, but if anybody else wants to add anything, I'm pretty sure y'all do, then feel free. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I do, especially for all those sports that um, are not at home a lot, uh, that are traveling, especially for some major events like swimming and diving, water polo, track, golf, uh, even our softball team takes cross country trips is I identify um, student athletes that are so social media uh, are interested in social media, or maybe I, I go into our database and I look everybody who's a communications major and uh, I look at some of them and I, I train them. I um, kind of give them the rundown of how, you know, say, are you interested in setting up Instagram stories for when you guys are on this trip? And then, um, you know, we give them the password and we give them some guidelines and then and then all of a sudden their Instagram stories putting out content while they're on the trip and, and you're being able to moderate it and oversee it. But it's not necessarily something that you have to post, um, but all that content is is happening and then telling them, you know, if anything happens, even the coaches, too, might might help you something like like track. You know, you got 40 or 50 people traveling. Um, if, if somebody's able to snap a photo, you know, somebody won a bronze medal, they can take a photo, they can send it to you. Even if it's vertical, I mean, you can still find a, some way to use that. Um, and it's better than, you know, using a stock photo. So um, try to empower those around you. If you feel like you have limited resources, talk to those around you. See if they'll help you. They probably will, because at the end of the day, they want to help their social media look good, too. Um, so it's try not to feel like it's always on you, because I know I feel like that sometimes. Um, but I try to use the the resources, you know, student athletes and coaches to see if they they maybe want to help uh, when they're out on uh, out on the job and maybe I can't be there. So, you know, I've, I've one sport. I have the Dobo completely running the Instagram. She loves doing it. She takes, you know, baseline pregame on for basketball on the uh, Instagram story and, and it becomes a routine. So some people actually really enjoy doing that. And um it'll it'll give them almost a breath of fresh air away from their normal responsibility so that they might enjoy helping you out and then it's mutually beneficial to you yeah we we have another question here um from patrick it's from someone who's currently out of the field right now 
um, but they're having a difficult time finding their next role. Um, here's his question. It's, were there any times where you struggled to fit in your industry, find your fit in your industry? And what did you do to set yourself apart from other applicants? Um, I can kind of answer this, I think, because I've never not been in athletics. So I'm trying to figure out how to be helpful with this. So basically, when I was an intern at the SOCON, um, oof, actually, I'm not going to answer because I don't think what I'm going to say is helpful. So I'm going to see if there's someone else. Is gonna say. I can well, say I, can... I got you. Um, I think finding your fit in athletics is pretty like it can be pretty difficult and to be fair it's a pretty difficult field with um like there are a lot of people moving around people want to find a good place sometimes you know if you're working in like a smaller school it's in the middle of what feels like nowhere so there are always lots of different you know like places you can live I think when it comes to like finding your fit in athletics, you know, I was at my undergrad before coming to Oberlin. And while I loved my undergrad experience and like my grad experience there, it wasn't like a good fit for me in permanent terms. Um, I know for me, I wanted to come back to Ohio where my family is from and be a little closer to family. And in that I've been able to find a pretty great, wonderful community at Oberlin and within um, the Cleveland sports community. But I think as you look um, to like finding what your next step is, I think you need to know, you really need to look at what you want on a personal level, because the job will really, as we all know, as athletic communicators, you know, the job takes up our weekends, it can take up our weeknights, it can take up a lot of time in our own schedules. So if you're in a place where you know that you will thrive personally, like, you know, you need to be in a city or you know that you want to be in the mountains or in a rural area, finding that first. And then speaking to people in the field, there are a lot of jobs on the NCAA marketplace. There are a lot of jobs on CSC jobs, but having those one-on-one -on -one, like communications and networking, um, I think that's where you're gonna find way more opportunities than what is typically posted, right? Um, I hope that kind of answered the question, but I think, you know, like the main thing, the main takeaway is like finding a place that you will be comfortable in your personal life that will then lead you to a place where you'll be comfortable professionally. Yeah. And I can say as someone who just started a new position, part of finding that was knowing how to display my work and finding a way to do that. Um, by, I made a website where I had just kind of a drag and drop website where I was able to display my work and show the different kinds. And I think that's something that was super helpful because even if it's not something that I actually made for like an actual project, even just going and throwing something together, like you guys were talking about testing out what looks good and something that you like and recreating that. And I found that super helpful. So we are coming up to the top of the hour here. We have time for one more question. If your question didn't get answered, you can... Um, message any of us here and we'll work to get the answer for your question. I'm going to touch on this last one here. It, can you guys talk about your experiences in balancing using what's trendy and popular while also maintaining a professional balance on your social media accounts? Yes. So TikTok, <laughs> going back to TikTok, um, obviously there's some trends that are not appropriate slash professional that you can translate from a student athlete's page to your page um so with that sometimes what I'll do is I'll take the sound or the song that's used on a TikTok and use that in a different way or mainly that's what I'll do is I'll literally I'll take that sound and I'll just use it in a different way whether it's over a recap video um or whether we just ideas are always bouncing around in my head. So it might just pop up. Um, so I would say like, just keep in mind, like, yes, you want to think out of the box and my opinion on social media and how you do it is it's never a good idea to play safe. Like, yes, it's play safe, but also think out of the box and take risks sometimes without being too crazy. Um, so for instance, I'll say there's a trend right now that's going around. It's like, 
of course I'm a yeah of course I'm a volleyball player of course I do x y and z like there was we literally just made that for our beach volleyball team and there were some things that they were saying and I was like we cannot use that guys let's think a little bit more like I'm a beach volleyball player. Of course I have sand in my hair, like, ha ha. Um, so just being able to communicate that with your student athletes and also keeping in the back of your mind, like you are representing your school in that brand. So you have to be able to find that balance in having fun, but also like, yeah, I'm, I'm representing the university of new Orleans right now too. So. I echo that 100%. I think um, like, TikTok is a place where it, you can go, you can get really hot really fast and go viral and just take off. Um, it can also go viral for the wrong reasons. I think anybody's been, like most departments have been on both ends of the spectrum. And I, you need to remember that, I mean, I know for me, like I was, I'm from like Columbus, Ohio. Like I was an Ohio State fan from the minute I was born. I was born like in Ohio State Hospital, right? So like you're catering to, even at smaller D3 or NAIA JUCO levels, you're catering to people who are very young and people who have more access to the internet and social media than they ever have had before. Um, So you can have like six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds watching these videos as much as 80, 90, 100-year-olds watching these videos. Um, Understanding that your brand, like we are not, athletics is not supposed to be this super, at, at least, majority of brands are not meant to be these super sassy, provocative, aggressive brands. Um, maybe Gritty from the Philadelphia Flyers. It's one of the only mascots that has that kind of um, MO. But understanding you don't, you know, when you create content, you don't need to make the most provocative or have the most crazy opinion or do the riskiest trend um, to have successful and viral or exciting fun interactive um content and videos yeah like we went viral for our men's basketball team doing the michael myers challenge wrong like granted it wasn't unprofessional but going off of her point like you can go viral for the right or wrong reasons we went viral for the wrong reason but because people were like what are y'all doing but it was funny still <laughs> Well, I'd like to give a big thanks to you guys, our presenters today, for the discussion and your insights on communication strategies and trends in the creative space. I really, We really appreciate your questions as well for everyone who's submitted any. And if we didn't get any to yours, just make sure you send those over to us. And again, the webinar will be on demand later today. So share that information with your colleagues. We encourage you to check the CSC website collegesportscommunicators.com for updated information on what's on tap for CSC programming and continuing education. And stay tuned for more information from our CSCU committee on a free virtual two-day series of webinars that will take place in June for all young and emerging sports communications professionals. Thanks again for being with us today, and we were happy to sit down and talk.